you to imagine writing an autobiography, what would the title of your autobiography be? So go ahead, take a few seconds, inshallah ta'ala. What would the title of your autobiography be? And don't be lame and put your name. Think about it. Title of your autobiography. You wrote a book about your life. Let's say that you're 80 years old, you're looking back, what's the title of your autobiography? It's actually a really, really good exercise. Anybody want to volunteer? Yeah. My sins. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Change it to my repentance, bro. <laughs> this is the good side. Autobiography is how you overcame. But no, uh, why did you choose that? Because I believe uh, there is less to know about myself than what I did wrong and how I So there is less to know about yourself, about what you did wrong, and how you overcame that before you left this world? Jazakallah khair. Anybody else? I'll take one more. It's always really introspective. Yeah, you. You guys look like your friends, right? Brothers, mashallah. All right. My uprising, beautiful, intifada, You're trying to get me in trouble. Got a Palestinian on stage saying intifada. All right, uprising, why am I uprising? Why? So you've, you've been over time through a lot and there's a massive uprising. All right, I'm gonna take your brother too, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, don't tell me you forgot it. Don't say the downfall, uprising the downfall. What's your, what's your autobiography titled? Allahu Akbar. Man, that's beautiful. Does my name have meaning to me? Because his name is Muhammad. Does my name have meaning to me? SubhanAllah. Beautiful. I already know what you mean by that, so I don't have to ask you for an explanation. Dear brothers and sisters, as we're thinking about this idea of your autobiography, this is a powerful exercise about how you write your life story because there's something very interesting about the way we function as Muslims in terms of our mindsets. We always put the conclusion and work backwards. We always put the conclusion and work backwards. When we talk about our lives ta'ala in the afterlife, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي جَنَّاتٍ وَعُيُونَ آخِذِينَ مَا آتَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ مُحْسِنِينَ كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ لِلسَّائِنِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily the muttaqeen, people of conscience, people of piety, Allahumma ja'alna minal muttaqeen, Allahumma ameen. May Allah make us amongst them. People of taqwa are in gardens and springs and rivers and trees and palaces. They're in Jannah. Allah is giving you the scene. Allah is giving you the end, giving you the conclusion, the scene. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَخِذِينَ مَا آتَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ They're getting exactly what their Lord promised them. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ مُحْسِنِينَ They used to be people of excellence before. Then Allah describes the actions. كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ They used to sleep little at night. وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ And then before Fajr, they would spend that time making istighfar. وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ And then in their money, they used to spend upon the one who asked and the one who was forbidden. Meaning the one who was not able to ask due to circumstances or otherwise. Allah gave you the conclusion and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moved you right back to what it looked like in this life. Meaning try to picture yourself as a person of Jannah looking back at this dunya and then consider the worth of this dunya. Try to look at yourself standing on the day of judgment and then consider the value of the day that's ahead of you. Look from there 
And consider that your ultimate conclusion. This is our success, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, as a group of believers that are celebrating the righteousness that led us to that place. I knew this day was coming. I was ready for it. And then when we think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, the very first page of Yusuf alayhi salam, before Yusuf alayhi salam saw the bottom of the well, before Yusuf alayhi salam saw the temptation the lady that was throwing herself at him before Yusuf saw slavery, before Yusuf saw the rotting inside of a prison cell, Yusuf saw a dream. It starts off with that. The story of Yusuf starts off with the final chapter. When Yusuf says, Ya abati inni ra'aytu ahad ashara kawkaba. My, my father, I saw the stars. I saw 11 stars prostrating towards me. And I saw the sun and the moon prostrating towards me. So it starts off with the dream, the end. This is the final chapter. Now let's talk about how we got there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gives you the story of how we got there. Because you start with the conclusion. When we talk about the life cycle of this ummah, we have an explicit detail where Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him will return. Where a dajjal the Antichrist will rise from. The events that will unfold in the last days of this world in precision, in precise details. We know locations. We know the conversation between the Mahdi and Isa alayhi salam when Isa lands and he comes to pray behind Mahdi. And Mahdi takes a step back and says to Isa alayhi salam, you lead. And he says, no, no, you continue the salah. We know all of this in precision. And we could speak more about that than we could about the months to come the events to come as a life cycle of this ummah. We know more about the last days than we do about the next days. The conclusion. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala on a personal level, when he was going through his tribulations, going through his trials, when he was slandered by a filthy man, whose name was also Ahmad, but he was anything but praiseworthy, anything but Ahmad, Ahmad ibn Abi Duad. And he would say, he would torture Imam Ahmed. And there was a time, or he led to with his slander, the torture of Imam Ahmed rahimullah. And there was a time that Ahmed ibn Abi Duad would be welcomed into the palaces of the, of the rulers. And he would be welcomed into the highest gatherings to speak about Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal radiallahu ta'ala anhu rahimahullah. And Imam Ahmed would say, Bainana wa baynakum al janaiz. Between you and us is the day of the janazah. Between you and me is the day of the janazah. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah had maybe the largest janazah in the history of our deen. Millions of people came from all over to pray janazah on him because of the benefit that came from him. Ahmed ibn Abi Duad was thrown away, cast away, a nobody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the end of Abu Lahab in the beginning of the call of Islam. How powerful is that? How powerful for the Prophet وسلم, to be standing on a safa and to be calling the people to Islam. And think about how humiliating in the worldly sense of a circumstance this seems like. No one responds to you after you've been honored, after you've been loved. No one responds to you. They look at you like you're a weirdo. They look at you like you're a madman. And he's standing on Safa and he's calling upon his people and his people love him. Just a minute ago, they were testifying to Al-Ameen. You are Al-Ameen, we trust you. You're this, you're that, lavishing praise. And now, pin drop silence. And the mockery and the murmur start. And Abu Lahab stands up proudly, says, Tabbanak. I can't even repeat the word, SubhanAllah. Curses the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, humiliates him, and Allah reveals the conclusion. تَبَّتْ يَدَىٰ أَبِي لَهَبٍ وَتَبَّ مَا أَغْنَىٰ عَنْهُ مَالُهُ وَمَا كَسَبٍ 
سيصلى نارا ذات لهب وامرأته حمالة الحطب في جيدها حبل من مسد Allah gives us the conclusion from that time Allah reveals the exact precise punishment of Abu Lahab in the fire and the same words are used towards him when Imam Ahmed said بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ الْجَنَاءَةِ between us and you is the funeral. Look at the Prophet like some when he left this world and look at Abu Lahab. SubhanAllah, Allah humiliated him even before he left this world. His body rotted, a filthy corpse. He was cast aside and no one wanted to see him out in any tribute. Gone. Whereas the Prophet Wasallam's death was the greatest tragedy. If you walked into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, and you knew nothing about Muhammad ﷺ, you would say, what a great man. How much he must have moved these people. Allah gave us the conclusion of Abu Lahab early on. Because it's the last chapter that matters. And sometimes it's important for us, just like Yusuf السلام, was given his dream early on. Just like Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, had that foresight. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforted the Prophet وسلم, with the conclusion in the very beginning. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about our celebrations in Jannah as if it's a conclusion that we can count on. Should we invest ourselves in that fate, in that eternity? Once you start from that point and you look backwards, then everything falls into place with the journey. Everything falls into place with the journey. The Prophet وسلم, and he did this in multiple ways. Sometimes in one hadith, the Prophet وسلم, drew lines. In one hadith, he extended his neck to show the difference. And in one hadith, he took two stones. The hadith of Abdullah ibn Buraydah, and he threw two stones And he said, do you know what these two are? And they said, what? And I want you to imagine this is one and this is two. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that this is the human being. This is his ajal. This is the date of his death. This is his amal. This is the hope that he had in life. And he stood between them, according to some of the explainers of that hadith. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This gap that I'm standing in doesn't exist. This is a part of life that you thought would come that never actually came. You had hopes in it, but you died before you could realize it. And the idea was that every single person in the graveyard has some level of unfulfilled hopes. But what's the cure for that? The cure for that is instead of having lofty hopes in this life, let all of your hopes be after this point. If you're storing your hope for this point, this is a certain transition point in your life, in your existence. And I'm intentionally using the word life. This is a certain transition point in your life. And if you've stored your hope for here, then you will find it in a way that is greater than what you could have ever hoped for. But if you store your hope here, and you're counting on this, the date of your death, not coming too early, then it will be disappointment here and it will be disappointment there. Store your hopes, your amal, for that part of your journey, not for this part of your journey. That part of your journey is certain. This part of your journey you're unsure of. It could be tomorrow, it could be in 10 years, it could be in 20 years. You don't know. But remember your autobiography and I hope you all have the title for your autobiography and I look forward to reading some of them inshallah. Write the conclusion. Write the last chapter. SubhanAllah, one of the beautiful things as we've been going over over the last few nights is the connection between the beginning of the Qur'an and the end of the Qur'an. And that's all I've been, SubhanAllah, looking at. Some of the first verses and some of the last verses. Last night I asked what's the first dua in the Qur'an and it is ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Guide us to the straight path. At the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us those heavenly verses, and the entire Qur'an is divine, those verses that were given to the Prophet sallallahu in the highest of places, and they allow us to elevate to the highest of places. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us at the end of those verses, وَعَفُ عَنَّا وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَارْحَمْنَا أَنْتَ مَوْلَانَا فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ Forgive us, have mercy on us, pardon us. You are our Lord. Grant us victory over a disbelieving people. It was a request for a nasr a request for victory. Because there is success on the individual level and there is victory for the ummah. As for the believers, we already said, <laughs> Verily, the muttaqeen, people of piety, are in gardens, springs, rivers, palaces. They're in paradise. They're looking backwards. They were people of taqwa. They perceived a moment that has now come to reality for them to where they can see it and feel it. And Allah says in the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Hudan lil muttaqeen. This is a guidance for people of taqwa. You will not benefit from the Qur'an or access the Qur'an unless you are willing to abide by the Qur'an and unless you are going to try to experience it in a way that you become aware of the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you and you live your life in accordance with that sight of Allah upon you. And then Allah talks about victory for the believers. And Allah says about the victory of this ummah, وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Victory, the ultimate victory, belongs to the believers, to the muttaqeen in specific, people of piety. So the end of Surah Al-Baqarah is an ask for an nasr an ask for victory. What does the Qur'an end with before the Mu'awwidat? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ the help of Allah has come. SubhanAllah, think about how powerful that is. When the help of Allah has come, when the victory of Allah has come to you, and the conquest has come to you. And you start to see people embracing Islam in large groups. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا Declare the glory of your Lord and seek His forgiveness and He is always accepting of repentance. It started off with a request in the beginning of the Qur'an, subhanAllah, the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, asking Allah for victory. And then it comes to, the victory has come. Now what do you do? And as Ibn Abbas ta'ala explained, that this was the death announcement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You've written the conclusion of your life on this earth. This was your ultimate conclusion of life on this earth. As an ummah, you are bound for victory. As an ummah, you are bound for success. As an ummah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has promised you great things. And even if you don't live to see the glory days of this ummah, know that you are a part of a glorious ummah, and so long as you were part of the process of bringing back that revival and glory, you will have the reward for that revival and glory, which is destined for you as an ummah. Destined for you as an ummah. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started off with the story of Adam alayhi salam, the first person mentioned in the Qur'an by name is Adam alayhi salam, coming down from the heavens and then making his repentance and achieving through that repentance a higher level in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than, than he was before. Because tawbah actually elevates a person. As Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah describes so beautifully, he said that when Adam alayhi salam was expelled from paradise, Iblis was happy. He was pleased. But what he didn't realize is that when the diver goes to the bottom of the ocean, he gathers the pearls, he gathers the precious gems and stones at the bottom of the ocean. And then he rises up once again. So the first person mentioned to us in the Quran is Adam alayhi salam coming from paradise to this world. And the mistaken bare eye might see that as humiliation. But instead, he comes down only to gather the best of this world and to rise to a higher position than he was in the first place because he repented to Allah. The last person mentioned in the Quran is Abu Lahab. 
who had the opportunity to rise like Adam alayhi salam, but chose, but chose the lower way. And hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was explicit with his descent from this world into hellfire. You were put in this world with the opportunity to ascend like Adam alayhi salam, but should you choose to descend like Abu Lahab, that is a fate that you have chosen for yourself by your actions. And you cannot overpower the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not wrong you with his will. It starts with this story. It ends with this story. It starts in Surah Al-Baqarah with a request for victory, and it ends with the announcement of victory for the ummah. Always start with the conclusion, and then come back to where you are, where you're supposed to be, and ground yourself in that conclusion, and write your story in accordance with the conclusion. Now, subhanAllah, some of us can't see past surface level. And it is a miserable existence. And I say that and I feel sorry for people. I feel sorry for people. It is a miserable existence if you don't believe that there is anything past that grave. What a miserable existence if you think this is it. What a miserable existence if you think it ends with this doesn't end with this. And what a beautiful existence. What a beautiful existence if you merely see this as a bus stop, as another stop in the station. What a beautiful existence if you are able to appreciate and show gratitude for all the blessings that you have in this temporary world. Hence, your happiness grows, your pleasure grows, your contentment grows, and you don't even believe that this is the abode of happiness. Because you know that there's a much more vast abode where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you with something should you stay the course. But the difference is not in the existence of this space or the existence of this space or the existence of this space. Two people could be standing in a graveyard and looking at a grave and feeling entirely different emotions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to broaden our vision. And when we see victory and defeat, even in the worldly sense, in the material sense, only by the externals, we're not able to think of a proper conclusion because we can't see past chapter 3. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks to us in Surah, in surah Rum, when Allah Azza wa tells us about the battle of the Romans and the Persians, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the prophecy through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of a change, something's going to happen where it's all going to change, it's all going to flip. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about those people who can only see surface level. Allah didn't even say they know the life of this world. They're not even experts in the life of this world. They only know surface level of this life. They only can see the very outward surface level of this life. And they're even more heedless about the hereafter. With the hereafter, they're completely heedless. They have no idea what they're talking about, no clue. They're completely blind to the hereafter. And when it comes to the matters of this life, they only see outward. They can't see deeper. They can't see past surface level. The surface literally being that grave. How can they write a conclusion when they don't even believe that that part of the book exists? How can they write their story properly if they don't even know where their story extends to? How can they begin to envision another life if they only know this fraction of the journey? Dear brothers and sisters, when we think of our journey of life, we're not just talking about our life of this world, we're thinking about our journey of existence. And subhanAllah, nothing can possibly make sense to us, not our ease or our hardship, not our material victory or our material defeat, not our ummah successes or failures or our individual successes or failures without the